So let's look at confidence intervals under um, a different set of assumptions. So we've been um, working with Z values. And so in working with Z values, we know that the central limit theorem tells us that the samples, um, once if you were to repeatedly take samples, you'd end up with a normal distribution. Or if you were to repeatedly take proportions of a certain size um, from a given population, you still would end up with something that approximates a normal distribution. Um, and so with confidence intervals and we're working with the normal distribution, right? If you know um, a few things, right? If we're going to use z values, so normal distribution, what I'm really saying is we're going to use z values um, in our margin of error, where the error was z and time sigma over the square root of n. Um, so this is based on the fact that um, there are certain there are assumptions of normality. There's another similar margin of error that is based on a different parameter. It's based on a t statistic. It's based on a um, not a normal distribution, but a so-called t distribution or student distribution named after a gentleman who was doing research um, many, many years ago and the company that, that made beer didn't want him to use their name or go under his name, so they just said it's a quote-unquote student distribution. Um, and what the big thing is that it uses the population's um, standard deviation, I mean it uses the sample's standard deviation. So this is what we're going to talk about right now. Um, right, so what we're going to talk about is when do we use this so-called t-statistic versus the z-value that we've been using. It's just been straightforward for the most part. You could just use inverse norm depending on the confidence interval and you could figure out what that z-value is. Um, so with that first condition, with the first set of assumptions where we said it was a normal distribution, um, we could go that direction as long as sigma was known, right? Sigma needed to be known. Um, and so if sigma was known and if the population was normally distributed, um, then we could use um, this formula to um, calculate confidence intervals. Um, or Um, right, still sigma known. Um, and as long as your sample size is greater than 30, um, so, if, um, and so those are the two conditions under which we can, um, use this formula to determine confidence intervals. So in both cases sigma has to be known and you have to have a normally distributed population, you're good to go, or sigma is not known and n is greater than 30, right? Your sample size is greater than 30. Um, we're going to use the t distribution Um, and in this case, we're going to use S. We're going to use the population sample standard deviation. 
Um, and so the one big difference between these two things is um, if you have a sample, right, if you're trying to calculate IQ, 101 for a class, 101 for an individual in a class, 108 for an individual, 97, 85, and you use all of these to come up with an average IQ, you will also be able to get the standard deviation. Um, you just drop that into your calculator and you'll get both the average IQ and also the standard deviation, um, right? And so, and we'll also know what N is. So this is very similar to what we've seen before with the big differences that we have to justify its use or at least understand it and provide some justification. Um, and then show you how to determine the, the T value here. So what are the assumptions here? Um, so for these, for this one here, we're going to say um, sigma is not known. Right? You don't know what it is for the population. So, and we're going to say it's a normally. So sigma is not known, which means we just have a list of values and we have no idea what sigma is. And it's a normally distributed population. Normally distributed population. And so we can use some tests to the we can use a histogram to help us determine if it's a normally distributed um, data set and also um, we can also use um, quantile plots and so forth so that's right so we have that that's number one and number two um, sigma not known and um, your sample size is greater than 30. All right, so the calculations are fairly simple. We're going to take a look at um, how we would do that. Um, and then one other point for both of these, right? Um, we're still assuming that our sample size is um, we're, we're assuming our sample size is pretty small relative to the size of the population. So we're assuming our sample size is small relative to the size of the population. Um, right? So if, let's say that our population is a total of 100, um, 0 0.05 times 100 is going to be a 5. So if, right, so 5 relative to 100. So when, and that's still, um, that's, that's large enough relative to the population um, that we would have to use a so-called um, correction factor. So if um, n is greater than 5% of the population, um, we have to use the finite population correction factor that was discussed um, in an earlier video. So finite population correction factor. Um, so we're going to keep it simple, not do a whole lot with worrying about um, this finite correction factor just yet, but when that is the case um, where your sample size is more than 5% of the population, um, instead of using um, just simply this here um, for the standard error, which we're going to use, 
is this for the standard error times n minus n over n minus 1. Um, and so you'll see a module. I don't know if it was actually in a video, but there certainly is a module um, in, uh, in Canvas that talks about, yeah, I think it's just simply a module. Um, and so that's another consideration. That's one that we'll deal with um, a little bit later. Right, there is this right here is considered the correction factor. Now let's move forward. Um, so let me just kind of jump into an example um, and talk about the justification for this. Um, this one is going to be similar to one that we saw in a previous lecture where we had a sample of some number of test tubes. This time, instead of a value more than 30, we have a sample of 15 test tubes. So this is a smaller sample. And um, these test tubes, um, again, were being tested um, to determine the number of times they could be reheated before uh, before they crack. So number of reheats before cracking. And so again we're taking this sample and then we're using it to make a statement about the population of test tubes. And for our sample of size 15, let's say that very similarly to what we had before, we learned that it took um, 1,200, um, 1,230 reheats on average, right? Where we had 15, the first one might have been 12, 35. The next one might have been 1250. The next one might have been 1228. And there are 15 of these all together. So we averaged those out and we came up with a, a, an average of 12, 1230 times. So one test tube one took that many reheats, test tube two, test tube three. So that's the idea behind this. And then we took, found an average. Um, and since we had that list, we also know what the standard deviation is. So we're going to say that the standard deviation is 270. Um, from this information, I'm going to ask you to construct a 95% confidence interval um, for the population value mu. Now, for, the, for from what we've seen previously, we would have done something like this, um, where if we knew the population standard deviation, we could plug this in. And this value right here was 1.96. Um, the easiest way to think about what you do with a t interval is that if you're trying to make a statement from a smaller sample about the population at large, um, then, right, if you're trying to get a 95% confidence interval, but yet you have a smaller sample, the easiest way to get 95% into, into um, to be accurate with that, with that is to open up that interval. Um, so that you're more likely to capture um, this mean, the population mean. So the way um, to think about t intervals is that for small sample sizes, instead of 1.96, this is going to be something larger, 2.0, 2.1, 2.3, 2.4, 2.0. This is going to be larger. So it's dynamic, though. It's a function of the size. So sometimes 
it's best to, to see um, this. It's certainly a value here that we're going to look up in a table. And sometimes it's good to show that it's a function of the size as a subscript. And something like this. Um, so if we can look up a table, and in that table, based on the size and also on the confidence interval, we can find that t, um, then we can move forward with determining that confidence interval. So in our table, um, you're going to see something that's called degrees of freedom. I'll just call it df. So degrees of freedom. Um, or df. And that value um, is really just simply the number of elements in your sample minus 1. Um, so your degrees of, sam of freedom in this case, since we had 15 in our sample, we have 14 degrees of freedom. Um, so this is a lookup um, in our table that's going to help us kind of figure this out. So I'm going to pull up the table so that we can see how to use this. So a typical um, T distribution table looks like this. Um, I think hand in hand with this table it should be a picture. It shows a confidence interval. Um, let's do it like this. And we're interested in determining couple of values here and let's say once again we're looking at 95 percent so normally if we're looking at Z values we interpreted those values as, um, as as a standard deviation right Z corresponded to standard deviation the way to think about this is that it's more of a dynamic um, standard deviation or dynamic parameter um, it changes as a function of the size of the sample. So in order to get accurate information, we're going to have to open up that um, margin of error for smaller sample sizes. So um, we're working with two tails. And what this information here is saying, well, how much area is in one tail or how much area is in two tails? Well, we know that this is 2.5% um, in one tail and 5% in two. So in one tail it's 2.5% in two tails it's 5%. Um, so when it comes with confidence intervals um, when it comes to confidence intervals we can um, just kind of as long as you identify how much area how much of the area is in one tail it makes it pretty straightforward to go into um, the correct column. Now, there are other examples where it's not confidence interval, but um, hypothesis tests, where we're working with just one single tail, and it might be 5% here, um, and we're looking to figure out that area. So that's, it's a different animal, but that's why it shows it for one tail and two tail. It makes this, this table more useful. Um, and then over here, so we're done with this. We know which column we're in. Over here, we're going to select the row based on degrees of freedom. So um, we have this row here, and we have our degrees of freedom here. 
and where those two connect is the value that we will use for our t value and it looks like it's what 2.14 so t is 2.14 so notice that this is greater than the 1.96 um, so for our um, smaller samples we will end up plugging a t value in here that is greater than the value that we would use um, with a larger sample size or if we actually knew what the standard deviation was for the population um, so um, and notice that this value will get larger as our sample size gets smaller and imagine that we have we have a sample size of 12 of, of, of maybe two items the degrees of freedom would be one um, and that's a pretty wide window when we use that in a margin of error that 12.71 really opens it up so this value continues to get smaller um, based on how many samples are in the set um, how many samples how many um, values how many uh, um, elements are in our sample so that's one way to think about it um, and the smallest this value will ever get will be the 1.96 so as n gets larger it starts to approach the same values that you would find in a normal distribution so if I bring up the table the larger table um, you'll see how that's how that's the case so on our shared Google Drive which you'll find under the under canvas and syllabus um, when you click on that link it'll take you into here you'll see exams lectures quizzes if we go into resources and into um, which one would it be tables the triola stats formulas and tables are here and so we can you can take a look at that and start working with one of those tables um, and so this follows that same thing that we've just you know it's the same table even if it's formatted a bit differently but look what happens as our degrees of freedom gets higher um, our t value gets smaller and smaller and if our sample size is say 2000 then we're at 1.96 and if our sample size is just incredibly large the smallest this will ever be is 1.960 um, so for larger sample sizes um, these values are the same as those values you would find for normal distribution so for smaller sample sizes we will um, be able to, to compensate and make sure we capture the mean so let's finish this problem up now that we know I think we have everything that we need we know that this is 2.14 and let's figure out what that margin of error is um, it's going to be x bar plus or minus and we determined that the mean was 1230 so that was 1230 so that's going to be 1230 plus or minus 2.14 and 270 all over the square root of the sample size which we said was 15 um, so let's take a second and figure what that is 2.14 times 270 is 577.8 divided by the square root of 15 so divided by the square root 
of 15, um, 149, uh, 0.19. So that means that our confidence interval is 1230 minus 149.19 all the way up to 1230 plus 149.19. So let's do the math with that quickly. Um, 1230 minus 149.19. Ten eighty point eight one and let's just recall that so we'll say second and entry to recall that. Oh, I don't know if that's gonna I'll just have to type that in. Twelve thirty plus one forty nine point one nine thirteen seventy nine. So we can have, um, we, we're going to say that our 95% confidence interval is um, that those burners will require somewhere between 1080, um, call it 1081, to 1379, if I'm rounding off. Um, so let's do one last check. Um, let's see if our calculator can give us those same values. If we go in here and we're looking for T intervals, so that's going to be which one of those? That's number eight. And I'm going to uh, plug in the average of 1230, the 270, the 15, 95. Um, so we get 1080.5 and 1379.19. Uh, so to within a tenth, um, we get the same values. So we're going to get some differences because the calculator um, is not likely, likely to use simply 2.14, but the actual value could be 2.13. 86427 or and so forth. Um, so this is accurate um, and, and and it's about as close as we can get given that um, there's some round off. So it's accurate to the ones place. So 1080, uh, 1081 and 1380, 1379. Um, so let's capture that. see if we can paste that in. So you can use your calculator and the t interval function to do the calculations or you can um, use um, the explicit formula. Um, so that's how we work with uh, t intervals. And we'll try to get a few more examples. Um, so the next video will be a another example, um, a demonstration of how it's used.